Hello, good morning. All right. I remember when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, um, my mother used to take me to church, and uh, I grew up in a Catholic church. And um, I remember seeing a big statue about Jesus and the cross, you know, Jesus Christ, and uh, covered in blood, and uh, I used to get scared. But I always keep looking, you know. And so I grew up, and uh, instead of getting closer to Jesus, you know, I start walking the other direction. So for the um, for last 25 years of my life, if it has been anything on college, you know, you name it, I did it. And um, about a year ago, exactly today, huh? Amen. It was an uh, um, Easter Sunday, too. I was about to commit a suicide, you know. I was tired and uh, just for my past and um, drugs. And so, um, see, but God and um, my church, Riffy Church, Long Beach, people who, you know who you are, end up with what I was, you know, and I start praying for me, and it was a whole day stand right there. And he's, you're from Long Beach, and I was in uh, Third and Orange street clothes and everything because I was trying to jump from a big tree, you know? And, um, you know, they, they, they come to me with prayer, with praise, and, um, and they said, brothers, and, um, you know, they showed me a new way to live. And, um, oh, Lord. And so, um, love you, brother. <laughs> What's up, Steve? And, um, you know, and, uh, um, I have never done right in my life, you know. I always heard people that love me, that, that love me, you know, and, um, I believe in Jesus. And, um, my, my prayer is that through my, Testimony, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people be saved and um, get close to Jesus, to go to God, you know, and um, <laughs> and I, I need to, I, I write down because he didn't give me a lot of time, so um, I just gotta check. <laughs> and so um. You know, because that incident, you know, I became closer to Jesus, you know, and, you know, I'm not pretend that I'm, that I'm perfect right now, you know, but I'm in the process to become a true believer of Jesus Christ. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening. Praise the Lord. Uh, Chris is going to come bring us the word, so welcome, Pastor Chris. Hey, good morning, church. Good morning. It is a good morning. All right, I'm going to test you guys on this. You got a little preparation earlier, and if you were here a year ago, part of the church a year ago, you know I take this seriously. He is risen. risen he is risen indeed. I, uh, as a child, actually, that's one of the few things I remember about Easter every year. I remember Easter Sunday. I remember Easter eggs, I remember chocolate, and uh, I remember church, because after church, we had a big Easter egg hunt. And there was always, every year, one Easter egg that had a dollar in it. <laughs> so Easter meant money. Dollar was a big deal to me. <laughs> but I remember in church, I remember that the pastor would say, he is risen. And the congregation would say, very politely, he is risen indeed. And we, it was one of those churches where everybody knew how to speak at exactly the same time. And, uh, and it was in your little bulletin like, he says this, you say this. And so I was ready for it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounded very solemn and terrific. But you know what? I didn't get it then. I didn't understand quite how, what that meant, 
that Jesus rose from the dead, that he conquered death for all of us. I didn't understand the gravity. Today is about the meaning of life and, in many ways, the meaning of death. As we come in search of the meaning of death. Now, on Easter Sunday, people say a lot of different things. They say, Happy Easter. Some people will say, Happy Resurrection Day. And some of us are a little careful about saying Happy Easter, because if you actually know the story, Easter is not really a fantastic name for this day, because Easter comes from the name of a pagan goddess, Ishtar. And so when people, the the name Easter came from a celebration that was around, and the Christians decided to, uh, to sort of commandeer the the holiday because it matched up with the time of Jesus' resurrection. Well, so some Christians get a little uh, up in arms about calling it Easter, and sort of understandably so, so. It doesn't really fit. And some of them get upset about Easter eggs and bunny rabbits and such because they distract us from from Jesus, which to an extent is true. I got a lot more excited about Easter eggs than uh, than I did about Jesus being alive because that was the part that was emphasized to me as a kid. But I tell you what, when uh, I don't get upset if somebody says Happy Easter, I think it's great. I don't get upset about Easter eggs and, uh, and bunny rabbits and chocolate. That stuff's all good. The truth is, I am so excited that Jesus is alive that you can call it any name you want to. I'm just <laughs> so excited that he is alive, that I'm alive because of it, that I want to tell the whole world. Jesus said to the disciples, just the, on the night before he died, he told them, because I live, you also will live. Because I live, you also will live. See, Jesus' life is about more than just his life. His resurrection is about more than his resurrection. It is for you and I. The Bible tells us that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work within all of us who follow him. That if you believe in Jesus, the power that raised the dead, have you ever thought about that? How much power it takes to raise the dead? If you get somebody just a few seconds after their heart stops, you can uh, jolt them with a, a good bunch of volts and you could get that heart started again. But if you wait too long, all the power in the entire sun won't get that life going again. There's nothing you can do. But the power that raised Jesus from the dead On the third day, the Bible says that same power is at work in you. Have you ever considered just how much power that is? Have you ever faced a problem that was so much bigger than you and your strength and your hope and your ability to handle the power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you? Jesus told his disciples, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. We're going to be in John 20. We're going to be in John 20. There are many things recorded on the first Easter Sunday morning in the Bible. The stories of several of our disciples. It was the women, interestingly, who were brave enough to show up first. The men were still hiding in a room. But we're going to read John's story in John 20, starting at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, verse 7, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. 8. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Lord, we thank you for your word. We invite you to teach us. Lord, give us insight and understanding. 
And Lord, with this story, pray that you would give us hope, that you would give us new life. Lord, as we come to face the evidence, as the disciples come to a tomb, to look death in the face, Lord, help us to consider as they did. Help us to find life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My Easter Sunday morning, 2015, started pretty normal. I get up pretty early to go over my notes, excited for church, part of an awesome little church that meets in a school in Long Beach. It was only a year ago. Had an awesome Easter service, told my congregation, he is risen. All the beautiful faces said back to me, he is risen indeed. Remember, this is your job. Don't make me have to print a bulletin. It's not that hard for you to get. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was a great church Sunday. We had an egg hunt after church. I went home with family. We had a bunch of family over at my house. We had uh, an Easter lunch together. There were grandparents. There were a bunch of kids. There was another Easter egg hunt for the kids. There was an Easter egg hunt for the grown-ups, which I thought was pretty cool. My wife's aunt put money in the eggs. It was more than a dollar this time. It was really pretty exciting. It was full of love, full of life. The way Easter should be, really. It's the day of new life. But then I got a text from DJ. There's a man in a tree outside my apartment. I texted back, praying. <laughs> Wasn't exactly sure what to do with that information. <laughs> and I really did pray. I was concerned for the guy, but it was one of those situations. He said the fire department was there, and I said, well, the professionals are there, so they'll do their job. I got a uh, phone call a little bit later. It's Jesse. Jesse? Sets up every week, friendly guy, really strong, always super helpful, nice guy, Jesse. He's in a tree. What is Jesse doing in a tree? He's ready to end his life. And DJ said, I know you're busy, I know it's Easter, I know you got family, and maybe you could, maybe you come out, I don't know, it might make a difference if a pastor shows up. I said, I'm just a pastor. I don't have training for this, I don't know. Sometimes you get thrown into a situation in ministry that's a little above your head. <laughs> Text went out to, uh, to a bunch of the rest of the family. All of us don't know what to do. Peyton's the only one who has any training. He's down in San, in San Diego at the time. Peyton actually is, is trained to, to deal with situations of that nature. So I call Peyton. What do I do besides get you up here? <laughs> Which is an option. <laughs> and a lot of me feels like I... The fire department's there, the professionals are there, the DJ calls again. Fire department left. I gave up on him. He's still in the tree, he's been there for hours. What do we do? I don't know. Told my family, I've got a friend in a tree. He's about 40 feet up. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Except I'm just gonna go. And sometimes ministry works that way. You just go. You don't know what's going on. The disciples at this point in the story, you have to understand, did not know what was going on. They didn't wake up Easter Sunday morning saying, he is risen, you can bank on it. <laughs> Come on, Peter, sing it loud, he is risen indeed. <laughs> they didn't look on the calendar and say, all right, Good Friday just passed, you know what that means about Sunday. And we also just had Maundy Thursday, whatever that means, and we had... <laughs> They didn't have Easter Sunday written on the calendar. They woke up Sunday morning, morning, grieving the Savior, wondering what to do. They'd followed Jesus' footsteps for three years. His footsteps ended at a cross. Where to now? What to do today? We don't know much about how they were on Saturday. We have just a little insight from another incident that happens in Luke's Gospel Luke records a story of two disciples out on the road that Sunday morning, and when a man they don't recognize encounters them, asks them what they're talking about, they say, 
what everybody's talking about. Haven't you heard? Jesus of Nazareth. And they tell him the story. A man who was mighty in word and deed, whose miracles were incredible. And they say to him, we had hoped that he was the one to save us, to save Israel. The words really strike me, we had hoped. As I uh, got in my car and headed over back to Long Beach to, uh, to figure out where this man in a tree was, to find my friend Jesse, I remember thinking, this really isn't a good day on Easter. <laughs> Easter's supposed to be about life, and here's a friend who's given up on it. I didn't know what to do. I, uh, I found the, the police around the corner and talked to them and told them I'm a pastor, and they, uh, I was hoping they'd give me some fantastic insight on how to handle these situations. And they said, <laughs> it's over that way. Thanks for the tips. <laughs> Went over. There was a couple guys out there talking to Jesse. There was quite a few onlookers had filled the streets to gawk. Some of them had set up lawn chairs to watch the show. A bunch of them were screaming, just get it over already. They were tired of waiting. Showed up, started trying to speak love to my friend in a tree. I had to yell pretty loud. He was way up high. And man, he could jump around that tree like a monkey. It was something to see. As the day went on, more guys showed up. Mike, another Mike. Oh, it's Mike's birthday. Where's Mike Berry? Today's Mike Berry's birthday. Happy birthday, Mike Berry. Wherever he is, when he comes in, we have to say happy birthday, Mike. When, uh, and more people showed up. One by one, friends showed up. There were a few strangers out, Christians who just stopped to care about somebody on Easter Sunday. I remember at one point, it had been several hours by now, and, uh, and I thought, I'll just read him some scripture. And uh, I read from, I thought, I could just re-deliver my sermon. I delivered a whole sermon on new life this morning. I, could, I read him some of Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. As I was reading, one of the windows next to me, out of one of the windows next to me came a voice telling me to shut up. That there are other people here too, and they don't have to hear it. And want to hear me speak in the Bible. And I shouted back, that's my friend in a tree. I'm trying to save his life. And she said, that's not your friend. What do you think I'm doing here? It took hours. It took a lot of hours. We started to get worried that, he was, that Jesse was simply going to fall asleep and, uh, and fall. And I really started considering, what would I do? What would I and there were some other onlookers trying to help. Uh, one young man who, uh, who just lived nearby that, that promised to catch him and threatened, I'm going to be under you. <laughs> He's a well-meaning guy, but tried to climb up. Tried to... It was a long day. Well, we just kept pouring out love, just kept pouring out love. Mike Berry showed up, and, uh, and man, there was something absolutely striking about the difference between onlookers who didn't care at all about a man's life, a man made in the image of God, and believers who had new life in them, who just would not give up. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, I am determined to look at no man according to the flesh. In other words, when I look at a person... I don't see what the world sees. I don't see just the human being in whatever condition they're in now. He says, this is why. Because if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has gone and the new has come. If anyone is in Jesus Christ, God starts over. Jesus said, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Jesus came to bring us life. He took the death that we deserved, that we might have life. He made all kinds of promises of the life that we would have in him. And he hung it all on one piece of evidence, resurrection. 
When people demanded of Jesus a sign, he'd given them all kinds of signs. He had multiplied the bread. He had multiplied the fish with it. He had healed the lame, the blind, the sick, the lepers. He had raised the dead on more than one occasion. And still, the people demanded a sign. They said, you get one sign. And it's a resurrection. Called it the sign of Jonah. Three days in the belly of the whale was Jonah. Jesus said he would be three days in the heart of the earth. He said dead. And that he would raise again. Hung it all on that. The disciples kind of missed that. Now you heard Jesse's story. He spoke before you. I was concerned that day that my Easter was going to end terribly. And then I felt awfully guilty that I was thinking about my own Easter at all. And then I started thinking about my friend. I said, all right, we're going to do this. I will look at no man according to the flesh. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Easter's a perfect day for new life. Let's start over again today. And Jesse, by the way, thank you, Jesse, for sharing your story. And uh, as I talked to Jesse beforehand, he, he told me, I just, I just want God to reach somebody, reach somebody who needs new life with his story. And that's what God does. God writes stories of new life so that you can pass it on, so that you can give it away. Back in our story, John 20, John 20. Early on the first day of the week, verse 1, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now we know from the other Gospels, if you read all four Gospels, you get differing accounts, not contradicting accounts, but you get differing accounts. And you can attempt to use them to, uh, to say, well, they're not the exact same story. But the reality of testimony, the way testimony works, I remember I talked to a friend of mine who's a lawyer, a good lawyer. And, uh, and he said, you know, in court, when you hear testimonies, one of, the, uh, one of the calling cards, one of the hallmarks of stories that are made up is all of the witnesses will get up and tell the exact, precisely same story. You can tell that they've gotten together ahead of time and say, okay, we're all going to say this, right? Everybody says this. If all four Gospels told precisely the same story, it would be much more obvious that they made it up. But in fact, they each give a different perspective. Anyway, if you talk to somebody, if you, if you ever tried to, to settle out a story talking to your kids and you hear the different versions of the story, it's not always necessarily that somebody's lying, although that can happen. But you hear different perspectives on it. John gives his perspective on the story. Now, when he says Mary Magdalene ran to the tomb, we know from the other Gospels that she was there with a couple other ladies. And they had gone to the tomb, not hoping, oh, we're going to find an empty tomb, right? They didn't go dancing down the way and, and singing Easter songs. They went concerned, how are we going to roll away the stone? Well, when they found the, the tomb without Jesus in it, Mary is the one who comes running back to tell the disciples they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, as we consider the story, I want to point out to you that the story we have before us is not told in a way to sensationalize, is not told in, in a way to, that mythology is told with, with the grandness that, that's supposed to excite you and, and get you singing. It's simply told, matter of fact, this is John and how he encountered the story. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that if Jesus is not resurrected, that we who preach it are found to be liars, and you who believe it believe in vain. Your faith is futile, he says. Paul explains that everything in Christianity hangs on this, the resurrection. He said if it's not true, and he had to explain that because there were teachers in the church at that time in Corinth, where he's writing to, who were teaching that there was no resurrection, that Jesus didn't really raise from the dead. Now, they would go on to say, it's still great to believe in Jesus. And, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things about being in church together. And, and you know, it's, it's a great story. And sadly enough, you can still find that around the church today. I remember watching a, 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 a TV special, or it was a video that somebody wanted to show me. And 
And uh, there were Christian teachers, they were genuine Christian teachers ordained somewhere, and uh, they were explaining one at a time how each of Jesus' miracles wasn't really a miracle, but the fact that people believed in it meant something to them. And one by one, they went down through to the resurrection and said, you know, we don't really know that he was resurrected from the dead, but that's not the point. The fact that people believe in it makes it wonderful for them. I almost wanted to break my own TV. Paul said, if he's not resurrected, if this isn't the real deal, he said, give up on the whole story. He said, you're going to church, you're wasting your time. It's empty, it's worthless. Every one of us who preaches Christ, he said, if it's not true, then we're all liars. Don't listen to liars because they tell pretty stories. He said, but if it's real, if it's real, if the resurrection is real, then the same power that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us from the dead. Jesus conquered death. Understand, this is an all or nothing. And when Paul would explain it, Paul didn't go around storytelling. When you read the, the story of, of Paul in the book of Acts, it says he went from synagogue to synagogue reasoning together. It was not a storytelling, it was reasoning. He provided evidence. Paul was a legal man. And as he presented evidence, faith and reason came together. Faith and reason are not mutually exclusive. It is not a matter of faith or reason. Unfortunately, I, I grew up thinking that way, and the church I went to kind of presented it that way, that you got these two aspects. There's reason and, and logic, and you get into science, and then there's faith on the other side. But throughout the scriptures, anybody who takes an honest look at the Bible and reads it, just takes it as it is, will see that the Bible is a presentation to your mind, to reason. God says in Isaiah, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. But he calls you to re reason, to engage your mind. And the presentation we see here in John, here in chapter 20, is not a presentation of stories to excite you and make you feel good about new life. But evidence presented for you to consider and believe. And it will use the word believe several times. And as you believe, he finishes the chapter by saying that by believing you might have new life. That you would have life in Jesus' name. And it's on the line here. Will you believe or not? And so we take a look at the evidence. And the evidence is in the form of testimony. Testimony is how evidence is generally presented in court. We have John's testimony. We have four testimonies between the four Gospels. And then we have further testimony from Paul. But understand that testimony, one of the other things in, in court that you always have to worry about when it comes to testimony is, is the person sharing their testimony, do they have something to gain by sharing it? And many people will say, well, you know, the disciples made up the story to, to kind of cover their butts and you know then they got to start a whole church and then they started collecting money for the church and you know how churches makes a lot of money and that's, a, that's what they're really there for. Well that might be true of church in some parts of history but certainly for the disciples there was not much to gain by standing up for the resurrection of Jesus. In fact every single one of the disciples was persecuted and put to death or at least attempted to put to death. They had a lot of trouble putting John to death so they put him in exile made him live alone on an island. There was not much to be gained. And throughout the centuries, as you follow the story of the gospel going out around the world, those who shared it, those who proclaimed the life, the resurrection of Jesus, always, again and again, to this day, have a whole lot more to lose than to gain. Many of them losing their lives. Now, I know there are those in church who will abuse it, and the Bible talks to them and warns them who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But consider the eyewitnesses here. John, who stands up for this testimony at the risk of his life, tells his story. I've heard it said, some men might die for a conviction, but who would die for a concoction? Who would lay down their life for some story they made up? John tells the story. It begins with Mary Magdalene, who comes running to him from the tomb. Now, verse 2, he says, So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Now, if you're wondering why John says he, she came to Peter and the one Jesus loved, it reads a little awkwardly in, 
in English, but understand translation happens that way sometimes. If you try to translate something in English, it might sound awkward, but not necessarily in the original language. Who he's talking about here is himself. He refers to himself as the other disciple. For John, it was a matter of humility to not try to make his name great in this testimony because a testimony, after all, is a story about what God did. He was telling Jesus' story and didn't want to be featured highly and knew very well the danger of the pride that might come with everybody saying, oh, that's John, that's John. So he took his own name out of his, his testimony, just called himself the other disciple. But he adds a little bit to it here and in a couple other places. He calls himself the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Now, I don't think he means like the one Jesus loved the most. I mean, he likes Peter and he likes James and the other guys, sure. But he really loves John. <laughs> I really think that John probably spent some time thinking to himself, how am I going to describe myself? Who am I? Am I the funny one? It's generally considered he was the young one. He was probably the youngest in the bunch. He was a thinker, contemplative one. He just simply calls himself the one Jesus loved. He said, this is what defines my life. I'm a disciple. I follow Jesus. I'm the other disciple. And Jesus loves me. John, who was an eyewitness to Jesus' death and resurrection, John, who spent his life serving Jesus, laying his own life down to share the story, John says, this defines my life. Jesus loves me. That's what's made all the difference. That's who I am. Jesus loves me. Mary tells them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Verse 3. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, this is one of my favorite parts of the story. I don't know the meaning of it, like why it's important. I just know that John, remember he's still a fairly young guy at this point, says, okay, the two of us guys were running, and just in case it matters, we weren't racing, but if we were, I won. <laughs> Not that it's a race, but I still won. Just to make that clear, I was there first. John is the only, dis only one who records this part of the story. I just want you to know I got there first. There's <laughs> He's a guy. Verse 5. So John is there first. Peter is still catching up. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. He looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went inside. Okay, you got to picture what happens here. They're both running for it. And this is, you know, this is a bit of a cross-country run. they got to go from, from the, the place they're staying out to the outskirts where the tomb is. And they're, they're, they're huffing it, and John gets there first. And Peter, by tradition, is a bigger guy. And so you got to picture the big, old, a little bit older, and he's chugging along behind. But John gets there, and John is a contemplative one. You can tell from his writings. And he looks from outside. Peter doesn't stop at all. He's running, and he just goes right in. You know when kids race, and you're like, I beat you to the car, I beat you to the handle, I beat you to the chair. And <laughs> Peter doesn't stop. He just goes straight in. And there's a beautiful but subtle play on words here. It says that when John arrived, look at verse 5, he bent over, he's outside the tomb, and he looked. Now, Greek, the Greek language has a little more depth to, uh, to, and subtleties to some of the words. When it says he looked, the Greek word just simply means to, to look at, to see visibly. It's just observe. He just saw it. There it is. He's just looking in. But then when Simon Peter gets there, it's a different word in verse 6. He goes straight in. At the end of verse 6, he saw the strips of linen. Now, looked and saw are the same to us, but in Greek, the word saw... Behind that, the oro means to study more carefully. Peter is really looking at it. He, he's, it's a more of an intense word of looking. He's checking this out. And then, as he sees it, he sees the burial cloth and the linens. By the way, for those of you who are curious about the Shroud of Turin and wondering, there's many claims and arguments over whether that's really Jesus' burial cloth. One of the important matters to it is that it's just one cloth, whereas... Every description in the Bible descripts 
describes a bunch of strips of linen and a separate piece for the head, and so it simply doesn't match what we read here. Now, it could be that at some point they wrapped them in something else, but what's more important is nobody should worship a shroud. But, but it simply doesn't match the scripture, which is funny that people would spend hundreds of years. It's been around for centuries, by the way, but people get all excited about the shroud of Troy. That's not evidence one way or the other, and there's nothing fantastic about it. The power you need is in the resurrection of Jesus. So first, John looks in. Just observe. Peter goes in. He saw. He studied carefully. And then in verse 8, finally the other disciple, this is John, who had reached the tomb first, wants to point that out again, also went inside. He saw and believed. And there the word saw is a deeper word, et edo. It's where we get the word idea. It means to understand something. When you say, oh, I see, when we say that in English, that's what it means. It means I get it now. And the progression in those three words is really the progression of faith, isn't it? You start out just, well, I'll check this thing out. This Jesus stuff everybody's talking about. It's Easter Sunday after all. I'll take a look, see what they're doing. Everybody's all excited. But then you start to, a little more intensely, to look into it. But check this out. You know, maybe there's something to this. And you start to investigate the facts, the evidence that's presented here. There comes a point where you get it, where it clicks. He saw and believed. He believed it's true. Now, he didn't understand everything just yet. In fact, verse 9 tells us, they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They didn't understand like what the purpose of this is. Even though Jesus had told them outright, there are certain things, we're humans, we get told things and sometimes it doesn't click. But he saw and believed. Looking into the tomb, a close encounter with death will leave an impression on you. I want to tell you the story of a man named John Newton. John was raised by his mother with the scriptures, with the knowledge of God and faith in Jesus. Born in the early 1700s. Raised to memorize scripture and follow Jesus until he was seven years old and his mother passed away. His mom was concerned that her little boy, after she had gone, would forget the things that she had taught him. For several years, he did. At 11 years old, John Newton went to sea. In his own story, he says, I went to Africa that I might be free to sin to my heart's content. It was the late 1730s. Over the next few years, his soul was seared by a revolting and barbarous life. He was... He had joined the Navy, and after deserting, he was flogged. But he found success in the slave trade. Now, young John had opportunities to repent, and he certainly remembered some of what he was taught, even when he was very little. And he had some strong reminders when he faced the reality of death on several occasions. As a boy, he was thrown from his horse and nearly killed. He says it made a deep impression on him, but he says, I soon forgot. You ever had something in life strike you very hard, perhaps a near blow with death, and think, i got to remember this. But you forget. John forgot. Years later, he had an appointment with some friends to go visit a sailing ship called a Man of War. He was detained for some odd reason, and he missed the trip out to sea. His friends on the trip drowned at sea. And it could have been him. He says, I went to the funeral and was exceedingly affected. But this I also forgot. Forgetfulness can destroy you. Newton worked in the slave trade hands-on, shipping slaves in the very worst of it. His heart became absolutely callous. He took out his lust on captured slave women, and he found favor with several ship captains by teaching them how to pack more slaves onto a ship. He explained to them that though the mortality rate would increase, their profits would also increase, simply percentages. Sure, they'd lose some more people, but you're still going to make more money at the end of the trip. So they packed them in all the more. Newton's story goes from very bad to much worse. He mocked the faith of his childhood and made sport of destroying the faith in others who attempted to proclaim the name of Jesus anywhere near him. 
took great pride in destroying the faith of some young men who, jumped, who joined ship. And in a deal gone bad, he was captured and enslaved as he was trying to work out a slave trade with some of the Africans who were selling slaves to him, and he was captured. And he became a slave to those he was trading slaves with. He was made to grovel at the table of an African woman. His only food were the scraps that she dropped from her table, all because he forgot and perhaps because he quite deserved it, and he knew it. He forgot the faith of his childhood and forgot the close encounters with death that he had experienced. He tells the story of a dream that he had. He said it was a quite vivid dream. He was on ship, and a man came to him and gave him a ring, told him it was extremely valuable, don't give it up for anything. The man went away, and another man came aboard and talked him, pestered him into tossing away the ring until he finally gave in and threw the ring overboard. The first man who had given it to him showed up again, dove into the ocean, rescued the ring, but told John, I can't trust you with it anymore. And it struck him so deeply, and yet he forgot. Now, I tell you this story because I want to illustrate for you in a real person the power of resurrection, the same reason I asked Jesse to share his story. The reality of God's mercy. John Newton was, by all possible counts, a wretch of a man. Could even God himself save a wretch like that? Understand that the story of resurrection is not just about Jesus' resurrection. Because Jesus told us, because I live, you also will live. When Martha came out to Jesus after her brother had died only a few days before this, and said, if you'd only been here, and Jesus talked about the resurrection, she said, I know the resurrection. He talked about it as if it was some doctrine for the future. I know the resurrection that, you know, we'll all be, everything's going to be okay, and he's in a better place, yada, yada, yada. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. If anybody believes in me, even though he dies, yet he will live. And he challenged her, do you believe this? New life, is it possible? Is it possible for a wretch like John Newton? Is it possible when they showed up that Jesus could possibly still be alive? Let's get back into verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that that he had said these things to her. Mary goes back to the tomb, can't find Jesus, encounters Gardner, cries to the gardener, did you move him? Now Mary, understand, doesn't get what's going on. She's just there to do the right thing in spite of everything being crazy. Sometimes you don't get what's going on in life, you only know just to do the right thing. And Mary was in this place, along there was a couple other ladies that went with her, to simply honor the body of Jesus. They couldn't do that on the Sabbath. It was forbidden by law to do any work, and they couldn't touch a dead person. It was in their law, and so they had to wait through the whole Sabbath, and it was early Sunday morning. As soon as it was okay, they went out. They had no idea how they were going to handle it. There was a Roman guard. There was a giant stone. There were three ladies. How they were going to move this thing. And they didn't understand why Jesus had died. They just showed up to do the right thing. It's right to honor 
I have no idea why this went down, why things are happening this way. I only know to put one foot forward in the right direction. And so they went to honor the body of Christ, the one they called Lord. And when they couldn't find it, it made even less sense. She runs away to tell the guys, hoping they'll figure it out. They don't quite figure it out for her, so she just goes back. And she goes back, she finds the, the angel there, and then the gardener, and she think, says to the gardener, have you done something with him? And he simply says, Mary. And just hearing her name, isn't it beautiful that that's all it took? Jesus said her name, and she knew who it was. And Jesus tells her, go tell the guys again. They need to know. Verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Peace be with you. He said, Father sent me, I'm sending you. Now, in, uh, in one of those churches I grew up in, just like we used to say, he is risen, he is risen indeed, there was a traditional greeting when everybody would stand and greet each other. If you've been in a church like this, one person says, peace of Christ be with you. Ah, you've been there. You've been to my old church. And we would do that. Now, I was a non-believer. I'd go party. I'd go to raves on Saturday night, and I'd show up Sunday morning, and I hadn't slept at all. And, uh, and the, the, you know, the drugs had worn off, and somebody said, peace of Christ be with you. I was like, I know how to answer that. Also with you. I'm a church boy. <laughs> Doing my church thing. A little later on, I got saved. I started considering the evidence and found it amazing and true. And more than that, I found new life. And I was a new person. I went back to that church. And I remember I went back to that church and I remember like, I'm ready for it. You know, everybody faces forward at this church, so you don't actually get to talk to each other much. But I'm like, man, this church is full of people who don't know how incredible this is, what new life is really like. But I can tell them one thing. I can say, peace of Christ be with you. And I'm going to say it's so good. <laughs> so I don't know what they thought of me that day, but I went back into church and I shook hands like, the peace of Christ be with you. Because it's so good. <laughs> I'm not just a church boy anymore. <laughs> I found life. Because if Jesus is alive, I'm alive. And they, I don't care if they thought it was a weirdo. They probably did. But I want to tell you today, the peace of Christ is amazing. Jesus showed up alive and he said, peace be with you. He told them just a few nights before, he said, my peace I give to you, not like the world gives. See, it was a traditional greeting. People said, shalom, it's peace. You know, it's like, have a nice day. Now, when you say that, you're just being nice, right? It's not like you're being mean. You're just like, you can't give them a nice day. You're just like, hope you do. Hope it works out. <laughs> but when Jesus said, peace, he said, it's not just a wish. Not like the world gives. He gives peace. Peace be with you. And they were overjoyed. And he said, just like the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Verse 22, and with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. 24, now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Now, Thomas gets a bad rap sometimes as being, what, how do we know Thomas? He is doubting Thomas. I like to call him Practical Thomas, and I like Practical Thomas because I am Practical Chris. I like evidence. I like, I was, an I was a scientist before I was a Christian. I was an engineer. I want evidence. I, I want stuff to make sense. I want reason. So I like Thomas. Thomas, now understand, Thomas, he, Thomas followed Jesus for three years. And when Jesus was headed back to Jerusalem, Thomas was like, you're going to die. They want to kill you, haven't you heard? Thomas is the one who said, all right, let's go. If we die, we die. He was just practical about it. He said, you understand that everybody wants to kill Jesus and they'll take us down too. Let's go for it. Jesus says, let's go. But when Jesus did die, he said, I want evidence. 
All you people talking, talk all you want. I want evidence. May 10th, 1748. By some luck, John Newton had escaped his bonds of slavery and was back on board ship. But that ship hit a storm and his luck ran out again. The storm was so great that the boat was ready to founder. As the ship plunged down into the troughs, few on board expected her to come up again. As Newton hurried to his place at the pumps, he said to the captain, If this will not do, the Lord have mercy upon us. And his own words struck him. He realized that they didn't have much chance of surviving and that he was looking at death in the face once again. And he said the words, the Lord have mercy upon us. And he shocked himself that he called on the name of the Lord, the one he had thumbed his nose at for years, the one he had mocked, the one he had talked others out of. And he said, if this doesn't work, Lord have mercy on us. Mercy, he said to himself, amazed. Mercy, mercy, what mercy can there be for me? This was the first desire I had breathed for mercy for many years. About six in the evening, he records the story, the hold was free from water. And then came a gleam of hope, he says. I thought I saw the hand of God displayed in our favor. I began to pray. I could not utter the prayer of faith. I could not draw near to a reconciled God and call him Father. My prayer for mercy was like the cry of the ravens, which yet the Lord Jesus does not disdain to hear. Newton later wrote this about the gospel as it appeared to him then. He said, in the gospel I saw at least a peradventure, that means a small glimmer of hope, but on every other side I was surrounded with black, unfathomable despair. On that day, facing death once again, John Newton saw a tiny sliver of hope. And on that hope, he staked everything. He sought out God's mercy. He was 23 years old. And John Newton found new life. Thomas, who doubted, who refused to believe, unless he sees the evidence. A week later, in verse 26, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. To doubting Thomas, Jesus says, Stop doubting. There comes a time in your life to stop the doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. This is what Thomas should be remembered for. In fact, Thomas went on to become quite an evangelist. Went out reaching the world, passing on new life in Jesus. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet had, have believed. Jesus promises an extra blessing for somebody who doesn't get to see what Thomas does, but believes. John finishes it out by saying, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John gets right down to it and says, this is the whole reason I wrote it. And this for me is the reason I preach. That you may believe, but understand it's more than just believing a philosophy. Christianity doesn't work that way. It's not just, well, I think it might be true. I'll give it about 85%. It's a decision of belief. The gospel is presented to us with evidence, and it's given to us as an invitation to accept. Jesus died to pay the price for your sins. And he rose again to give you new life. And you are presented with evidence, the evidence that John presents, one who would lay down his own life, and the evidence that Paul presents, and Peter, and Mary Magdalene, and many others, and the evidence of lives changed today as Jesse came to step up and show you some evidence that God still changes lives today, the evidence that John Newton shared. John Newton was 23 years old on that day in 1948 when he asked God for mercy. He had committed enough sins for an 80-year-old man and far worse. He was absolutely a wretch. He cried out for mercy and found it. Jesus took Newton's sins to the cross 
and buried them in a tomb, never to rise again. It is quite amazing what mercy can do to a soul, just how changed a life can be. Some years later, Newton entered the ministry and began making history. He changed England, starting with the church. In Newton's day, the church was in a wretched state. So much politics and greed, so much hypocrisy among the pastors, and worldliness and uncaring among the people. Yet Newton became a part of new life, the first generation of clergy that was called evangelical. Later, they were called the second founders of the church in England. As one of the founders of the Church Missionary Society, he laid his hands upon all continents, reaching the East Indies, Burma, and around the world. Some of the places that he had gone to trade slaves were reached with the gospel. He was one of the great influencers of his time and shook the world. Men like William Wilberforce, who fought tirelessly for decades until slavery was abolished in England, long before it was here, credited their faith and their, their toil to the preaching of John Newton. John kept above his study the words from Deuteronomy, Thou shalt remember that thou wast, wast a bondsman, a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. John Newton is the one we have to thank for the song Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I always wondered at that word wretch. When I heard his story, I understood. What God can do with a wretch is amazing. It can change the world. It can bring new life. It can do it in you. John finishes this story by saying, I'm telling you this story that you may believe and that by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you may have life in his name. Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does it very effectively in a whole lot of lives. But Jesus said, he came that you might have life and life more abundantly. I'll take that amen. I'll invite the worship team to come back up and let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for new life. Lord, we proclaim today that you are risen and you are risen indeed. Lord, I pray for those here who are just looking in from the outside, Lord, that you would draw them in to look more intensely, to check it out, and to see and understand and believe the evidence of new life. And Lord, make us new again and send us out to proclaim that Jesus came, and that he, if he is alive, then we are alive in him. That he is risen, and we are risen with him. Amen. 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 Let's stand up and sing. Change it someday for a career.
Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophy first hymn that ever got to me. It was my granddad's funeral, one before I was a believer. It's good to hear it again. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for teaching us. If there is anyone here, if your heart is not set right with the Lord, if you do not know peace, Jesus came to offer peace. He said, my peace I give to you, not like the world gives, but real peace. Jesus came to exchange your life for his, to take your sins to the cross and give you new life in him. And the power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you if you put your belief in him. If you would like to do that today, simply say this prayer to God, between you and God, not to me, but to God. Lord, forgive my sins. I am sorry for what I've done. Lord, I believe in you. I believe that Jesus paid the price for my sins. and I turn away from them. Forgive me. Take all my sins to the cross and bury them. Lord, please give me new life. Lord, I believe that Jesus is alive. He is raised from the dead and that he is my Lord and my God. Lord, please give me new life in the name of Jesus, as I give you this life. It is yours, Lord. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for loving me where I am. Take my life. Make it yours. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, if... Uh, you can give the Lord. God is good. If, uh, if you need to pray, then join us up here for prayer. If, uh, if you'd like to have some fun because it is Easter Sunday, then the, uh, the kids are going to go hunt some eggs. What, Andrea, which direction are they going first? Okay, we're doing that right away because I know some people got to get to some Easter lunch. So we are going outside to the courtyard if you want to see the kids. Now, grown-ups, this is not a grown-up Easter egg hunt. You can run your own at home, but all the kids take the kids outside, and uh, we're going to run that Easter egg hunt right away. They each get a basket. We have baskets for all the kids, and teenagers are kids in my mind, but teenagers don't get to go first.